Hello, everyone. Uh, Helen, can you see my slides changing? Yes. Uh, um, changing. Yes. Okay, um, perfect. Okay, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Moaz, and uh, I'll be uh, talking about how to run jobs on Perlmutter. So Perlmutter, uh, just like any other uh, large-scale system, needs to, uh, needs to use a job scheduler. And uh, here we use Slurm, which is an open source tool, and it's the uh, very same thing that we had on Cori. <clears throat> Uh, Slum does three. Uh, Slum take, takes care of three key responsibilities. Uh, one of them is to allocate the resources that are requested uh, in an efficient manner, uh, execute and monitor the jobs, and also manage the queue of the submitted jobs. So any jobs that are submitted by the users are first sent to a queue, and then that queue is managed based on uh, a certain priority that is associated with each job, and then it's the duty of the scheduler to schedule the jobs as it uh, deems fit. Uh, Perlmutter, as uh, uh, Rebecca described in the morning, is a heterogeneous system and consists of two different types of partitions, uh, the CPU nodes and the GPU nodes. Uh, when you initially log into the system, you're placed on a login node, which is, uh, which is basically something in between, which contains one GPU and uh, one CPU. That is basically uh, a shared node. And uh, the, the use case for a login node would be just to do simple text editing and you know, job uh, batch script writing and submitting the jobs. It's not uh, advised that you run anything, uh, you know, any job on the login nodes because this is a shared resource. And uh, if you're running, you know, making uh, extensive use of these nodes, other users will feel uh, you know, system slowing down. So, you know, as a good citizen of NERSC, it's recommended that anything, if you want to run a job, you request a compute node for that. Uh, compute nodes are typically exclusive, uh, with the exception of the CPU nodes in a certain uh, uh, queue, which is the shared queue. And we'll talk about the queues and how to use this facility later on. Uh, so let's have a quick look at the node types. On the right, uh, I, have a, uh, I have an overview of the, the GPU nodes. Uh, each GPU node consists of one AMD Milan CPU, which has 64 hardware cores, a total of 128 hardware threads, and it also has four Ampere A100 GPUs. Uh, the total memory available on a GPU node is 256 GBs, where each Ampere GPU contains 40 GBs of uh, hyper, uh, HPM. <clears throat> uh, the CPU nodes, as shown on the left, uh, contain two uh, AMD Milan CPUs. These are very same CPUs look, which are present, uh, which is also present on the GPU node. Uh, so the total number of hardware cores available on a CPU node are twice that of the GPU node. Uh, the amount of memory available on these nodes is also two times. That's 512 GBs of uh, memory on the CPU nodes. So before we get to how to run jobs, here is a note of advice. Be mindful that Perlmutter is being used by 7,000 plus users of NERSC. And uh, since it's a shared resource, it's important to be, be courteous and be mindful and try to follow you know, the protocols and the good practices that are uh, conveyed to you. For example, a good thing would be to, uh, before you schedule a job, try to classify your job or try to determine what type of job it's going to be. If you're trying to debug, uh, debug something, then you won't really be needing a lot of resources for a long time. But for that, we have a type of quality of service that we give through a debug queue. Then you can you know, uh, refer to that. If you realize that you want to have an interactive node where you want to do something in real time, like you know, uh, building a, a complex code, which requires a lot of threads to build, and then you want to do a quick run to check if it's running fine, then obviously you would want to go with the interactive node. And we also provide that quality of service through the interactive QoS. And if you decide you want to run a large production job, then you go through a, a, you know, a relevant QoS. And if you have a very long running job that has a, has a built-in capability for checkpoint and restart, then you, know, you would go through a preemptive queue. Uh, so I will go through the details of how to use these queues later on. Uh, but first, it's important to understand the, the type of job that you're about to run, the type of resources that you need, and for how long that you need. 
Uh, this will improve turnaround times for you as well as you know help other users use the system in a better way. Uh, jobs can be submitted uh, in two ways. One is using the sbatch uh, command, which, is, which basically you write a batch script and you submit it through sbatch. Uh, the other option is the salloc option. That's basically a command line option. Uh, it's recommended that you use a batch script. That way, you know, it's kind of re reusable resource. So if you have like multiple jobs, you could just, you know, make slight change in the batch script and then, you know, reuse it. SLOC is usually recommended if you're trying to get an interactive node. Uh, this at the bottom here is an example of using SLOC where we are requesting one node, uh, one node of CPU type uh, through the uh, debug queue for five minutes. The dash A is the project that you want uh, this uh, you know, resource to be charged to. Uh, so before we talk about how to write an SBAT script and how to submit it, let's see what happens when you request a resource. So uh, initially you're placed on a login node and that is where you will write or submit your SBAT script from or where you will make the SLOC request from. So once you make the request, the resources are allocated to you and one of the, uh, and the resource list basically consists of multiple nodes. And out of those nodes, one node will be assigned as a head node. That is where your batch script is actually going to be executed. Uh, or the launcher command will be executed. Once the launcher is uh, you know, called, uh, it basically initiates the parallel processes on all the nodes that are included in the resource list. Now to the, to the actual step, how to launch a job. Uh, so this is how a batch script would look like. The one on the right and on the left, they both are equivalent. I'll, I'll talk about why they're same. Uh, but they basically do the same thing. It's just a different way of writing them. The very first thing that you do is you write the type of shell that you want the script to be executed in. Here we are using the bash shell. And after that, we have some job, job configuration options. On the left, I'm using the, the long way of uh, referring, to them, uh, referencing to them. For example, dash dash account basically means the account that you want this, uh, this job uh, charged to. On the right, I'm uh, refer uh, referencing that using an, uh, you know, a short, short format of that, that's dash A. So everything on the left is same, uh, you know, equivalent to on the right. So you could use either of these. It's, it's better if you use the more verbose option, the, you know, the longer format, that's what I do. It keeps things, you know, simpler. Uh, so first we have the dash dash account. So these are some options which are, you know, recommended that you enter. You may not be able to submit a job if you don't have these but you may need to tweak these depending on the type of job you have. Uh, the second option is the dash dash QS, which is the queue or the quality of service that you want this job to go through. In this case, we are setting that to regular. After that, we have the number of nodes that we are requesting. Here I'm requesting two nodes. After that is the amount of time that, you, that you're requesting these two nodes for. If you just enter a number, then that would be assumed as minutes. For example, this is uh, 60 minutes. Uh, but you can also use this format, which is hours, minutes, and seconds. Uh, basically, the script on the right and on the left, they're requesting the job for uh, the resource for 60 minutes. Uh, then we have the constraint, which is the type of node that you want. Here, I'm requesting a GPU node, so I'm setting it to GPU. Uh, this is an optional thing, uh, which is the job name. Uh, it's, it's good if you mention this, because then it would make it easier for you to track the job uh, once you have submitted it. Otherwise, it will just get the name of the script that you have, and you may be reusing the script, so it gets really confusing. So it's important, you know, recommended that you you give it a name. Uh, this is the license. Uh, here I'm uh, setting it to Scratch and CFS uh, licenses. Uh, it's basically to tell the uh, the type of uh, storage system that you're using. It basically adds a tag to your job so that it, if you know. As a, as a certain system is down, a story system is down, uh, we will be able to hold your do jobs so that you know they do not fail. Uh, you know, just like it recently happened when Perlmutter Scratch had to go down for maintenance and uh, users who had their jobs labeled with this license, we were able to hold them so that you know, they didn't crash. Uh, and after that, you add your you know, job settings like you would in a typical bash script. For example, here I'm setting the number of open MP threads to one and then, then it's my launcher command here. You can use uh, any format, the one on the right or the left. There are a lot of other options that you could use here to see a complete list of options. 
I would suggest that you refer to the uh, manual pages. You can access that using man uh, as patch on your terminal. Uh, you may need to tweak and optimize the script for the type of node that you have. For example, if you are requesting a GPU node, make sure that you're requesting, uh, you're setting the constraint equal to GPU. Uh, each GPU node, as we discussed, has 64 hardware cores. So it's optimal if you run 64 processes on it. So we can set the number of tasks per node equal to 64 here. Uh, CPUs per task equals to two. Now, the CPU in the context of Slurm is a hardware thread, not a complete core. So one hardware core has two hardware threads and one hardware threads equals to a CPU for Slurm. So in this case, we are going to set it equal to two. Uh, and then you request the number of GPUs. If you set it to anything else like one or two, that is the number of GPUs that will be visible to your job. So make sure that you select that appropriately. Even though the nodes are exclusive, you still do not you know, view all the GPUs as it's if you do not request them. Uh, so the equation on the right is the CPUs per task. It's recommended that you use, uh, you know, compute C or the CPUs per task using this equation for the GPU nodes, uh, because that will make sure that you are not underutilizing your resource. Uh, the K is a number of tasks per node. For example, here at 64, so you take the, the term inside the bracket becomes one, you multiply that with two, and then that's two. So that's why I have two over here. And uh, when you're executing your command, you enter the total number of ranks that you want to launch. Uh, since we have two nodes here. Okay, so yeah, so we, we were on this GPU slide. And uh, so for CPU nodes, uh, we are going to you know just change the constraint from GPU to CPU. Uh, make sure that a task per node is suitable for a CPU node. We have two times uh, the, the course here. So I had 64 for the GPU node here, but the CPU node, I'll double that. And then, you know, when calculating the CPUs per task, I will use 128 here. And it will again turn to two because I have like the number of tasks that I'm setting is equal to the number of hardware cores. But in some, some people, you know, some uh, jobs, they require the task be a task per node be less because they want to utilize the threads. So, you know, you can make the change accordingly. Let's say if you're using 64 over here, task per node, you bring 64 here in this equation, that will give you C equals to four. So, you know, set this appropriately. Otherwise you will be enter utilizing the node and you will be uh, getting a performance hit. <clears throat> and here then again, I'm launching two times two ranks uh, 256 on the CPU nodes. Uh, so when we are talking about launching jobs, it's important to talk about affinity. Affinity is uh, how close or how your uh, processes and threads are bound to the, uh, to the hardware threads and the hardware cores. Uh, it's recommended that one MPI or one process is uh, bound to a hardware core. And to make sure you can set uh, this option, in your launcher command, that's dash dash CPU dash bind equals to cores. There are other options to do that. You can explore that using the CPU bind, you know, setting the CPU bind equals to help. Uh, but if you are trying to optimize the node usage, uh, this is what I would recommend. And while you're doing this, also make sure that you are setting your CPUs per task appropriately using this equation on the right. Uh, for the GPU node, it obviously will be 64 instead of 128. Uh, but you want to make sure that you're making the best of the resource that you have. Uh, when you're on the GPU nodes, you have an uh, additional component GPU. So we need to make sure that the affinity here is also, you know, the optimal. Uh, so each node has four GPUs and we have a total of 64 hardware uh, cores. Uh, these cores are divided into different NUMA nodes uh, and uh, uh, it, you will get the optimal results if the rank in a certain NUMA node has access to the GPU that is closest to it. Uh, by default, all the ranks will be able to see all the GPUs. And programmatically, typically what programmers would do is that they do a round robin assignment. That way, it is you know it is not guaranteed that each rank will be getting the GPU that is closest to it or is in the same NUMA region, uh, and that may increase you know data transfer times. And uh, you know when you're using unified memory, you may see some performance down, uh, downgrade. So if you're if you're you know if you're concerned about that, it's recommended that you 
you know, set the GPU binding equal to closest. That will make sure that each rank gets the GPU that is closest to it. Now to understand what I mean by this is so I'm using basically a vector head example from the January Perlmutter training, where we demonstrated how to build and run a GPU code. So in this code, I have an MPI code that is making use of, you know, making uh, kernel launches on GPUs. When I run it without any GPU binding, you can see that each rank has access, uh, is able to view all the GPUs. For example, this rank one is ha, has been assigned the GPU with this address that is 41, but it still can see all the other GPUs. Now we don't know what GPU is closest to it because the, the type of assignment that I did in this code was round robin assignment. But if I set GPU bind equal to closest and then I do the run, you can see that each rank is able to see just one GPU and that GPU is closest to it. And uh, you can check that using the, you know, this NUMA region. So uh, have a look at these highlighted lines, uh, rank one and five are on core 16 and 17. And you can see that core 16 and 17 are on the same NUMA node. So they have been assigned the same GPU that was closest to that particular NUMA node. So it's recommended that you set it equal to closest to make sure that you, you know, you get, uh, your ranks get the GPU that is closest to them. Uh, but if you have programmed your app differently and it doesn't really care if the GPU is close or you know far away, then uh, you can set it according to how, how you how you want. There are other options that you can explore, and you can go to the man page of uh, S run command to see how you can do your GPU binding in a different way. Uh, finally, we have thread affinity. So if your code is using OpenMP threads, then it's recommended that you set the bindings and affinity using the uh, OpenMP environment variable. In this case, I'm using these three environment variables. Uh, the first one is the famous one, which is used for setting the, uh, the threads, the number of threads that you need per, per rank. And the second one is the OMP places. This is where your threads will be, will be you know, the place that your threads will reside on. It could be, so right now I've set it equal to threads, which means a hardware thread. So each CPU core will have two threads, uh, uh, two OpenMP threads mapped to it. But if you want just one, then you know you can replace threads with cores. That will make sure that one uh, thread has one hardware core assigned to it. The third option of OMP proc bind, that's basically making sure that your threads are not relocated uh, uh, you know, to, to different uh, cores or different threads. And after that, you have your launch, launcher command. So you can you know, set them according to your application because you understand it better. Uh, finally, let's go to the job queues that, that we have been talking since the morning. Uh, the, uh, so we have different types of queues depending on the type of quality of service that you need. Uh, as I talked before that it's important that you determine uh, your job needs, your uh, resource requirements, uh, the time that you need them for, the type of node that you need, and the type of work that you're going to do, and then you know choose the queue. Now, let's say that you you want to do some simple file writing or you know some text analysis, uh, you know automated text analysis. Then you wouldn't want to waste your hours on a complete node because if you if you request an exclusive node to the regular QS, and even if you're using just one core on it, you will still be charged for the complete node hour. To avoid that wastage of time, it's uh, you know you can use the a shared QS. So what you will do is you'll sh uh, set your queue in your job script equal to, equal to shared, and then you know you can just do your sequential or the the whatever code or the serial code that you're trying to launch, uh, and this will charge you according to the resource that you use on that node. If it's one core, you will be just charged for that. <clears throat> If your if your job is uh, serial, just uh, you know, it's recommended you do not use S run because that has over overhead associated with it. Uh, but if you have multiple uh, you know ranks that you want to launch, you can use S run even over here. Uh, if you want to uh, get you know do debugging or you want an interactive node, there are two different Q, uh, there there are two different QSs for that. Uh, for, we have a debug QS, we have an interactive QS. Uh, debug has a maximum limit of eight nodes, where the maximum time is 30 minutes. So if, uh, if you know, typical uh, debug jobs, if you if you run, you know, they're typically short, you just want to hit a certain bug and you know, that that is it. So I think that's very appropriate. But if you want to debug, you know, on an interactive node, 
and you want to do it for a longer time, you could use the interactive node. Uh, the difference between these is of the time and the number of nodes that you that you can access and of how you submit them. Uh, debug QS can be accessed through an SPAT script, while the interactive has always to go uh, always goes through the SLO because it is interactive. And if you do a, job, a batch submission, uh, that won't really make sense. Uh, if you want uh, more information on these, you can go to this uh, hyperlink here. Uh, then we have the preempt queue. Uh, now let's say that you have a very large job that takes up a lot of resources and runs for a very, very long time. It will almost become impossible to schedule it because the, the type of resources that you're requesting, you know, uh, it will basically have to wait forever. So one way to get around that is to use the preempt queue that basically allows your job to be preempted after a certain time so that a higher job priority job can be uh, scheduled and then your job can be requeued at a later time. Let's say on a weekend when people are not submitting jobs, the job will you know be requeued. But it, uh, for this, it is important that your uh, code has checkpoint restart capabilities built into it so that when it's preempted, it's able to save its state and then it is able to return from the same state when it is uh, requeued. Uh, to utilize this, you have to uh, use the preempt queue, uh, preempt QS in your batch script. And you have these additional four options at the bottom that I have highlighted. Uh, the maximum desired time limit, this is 96 hours. So basically your job will uh, run for 96 hours maximum. That's the sum of all these sessions. And then uh, that's the checkpoint overhead time. Then this flag dash dash requeue means that your job will be requeued. If you do not add this, then it will not be requeued. Uh, the last one is an important one. That's the open mode. You have to set it to append. That is uh, because these files that you're writing your output to will be, you know, be appended when it's, it is requeued, so that you know these are not overwritten. So it's, it's something uh, you know preempt queue is to take advantage of if you if you run very long uh, jobs uh, for you know very long times. Uh, X for queue is another way of uh, saving your uh, uh, you know compute hours. Uh, if you have you know. If you need to stage data from HPSS, the, the long-term storage, uh, then it's uh, you know you can do that through Xfer because typically data transfer from HPSS is kind of very slow, uh, so it's uh, recommended you, that you do not waste your hours on a compute node. Instead, you use the uh, X Xfer queue, and that will save you a lot of hours. Uh, you can utilize this within your uh, production job script by using this command uh, sbatch dash dash q. Uh, Xfer and you know when HSI put the whatever file that you want to place, uh, or you can also do a separate job, uh, you know, batch script for this after you have completed your production job. Uh, you, you basically do the dash dash QS equals to Xfer, the time, the maximum time limit that you need, uh, the name of the job, the license, and then finally your HTAR command. Uh, consider, uh, you know, this uh, over here, you can see that we are not requesting any node type. Uh, because uh, or the number of nodes, because that would make this uh, fail. Because X for Q is, I think it's used uh, on on type. There are like some shared nodes that use uh, that are basically doing this, and uh, yeah, you can't really make a request here. Uh, so these are some advanced options. So till now, whatever we have covered is enough for you to you know run your job in an efficient manner. Uh, but uh, these are some advanced options that may help you getting the best out of uh, your experience on uh, Perlmutter. Uh, let's say that you uh, you have an SBAT script and you want to launch multiple jobs, you know, just using one request because you don't want to write separate bad scripts, but you just want everything bundled together into one. Then you can you can do that. Uh, you would just need to enter a separate S1 command for each of your jobs. For example, like executable A, B, and C, you'll have to have a separate launcher uh, command for each. Uh, but uh, make sure that uh, you request the resources appropriately that are needed for all these jobs and the time that they're needed for. The time here would be the sum of the time that is needed to run all of these. Uh, but if you want to run things concurrently that you, you want that all these jobs run in parallel, uh, through a single batch script that can also be done, but you have to make sure that you request the resources appropriately that are, which will basically be the sum of all the resources needed by all the jobs. For example, in this case, each job is using two nodes, so the total nodes that we request is six. Uh, similarly, the time here would be the maximum time needed by any of these jobs. It's not the sum as it was in, in the example before. 
there are some changes that you would need to make. Uh, that is to end the ampersand sign at the end of each launcher command and add the await instruction at the end of uh, all your jobs. Uh, this will make sure that your jobs run concurrently and uh, the, the job is not terminated till the last job has returned. Uh, job chaining is uh, something that uh, you may need if you have a sort of a workflow where one job depends on another and you want to make sure that a certain job is completed before a new job is uh, scheduled. Uh, for this, you can make use of the dash dash dependency uh, option in the S batch. So how this works is first you uh, schedule a job. Let's say we have a job first, for, we have a first job, we have a second job and we want that the second job we run only after the first job has been uh, completed. So what we do is we submit the first job using S batch with the dash dash parsable option and that returns a job ID. We can save that in a variable and then we can schedule the second job using the dash dash dependency option where we are going to set it to after okay followed by the job ID of the job that we, we wanted the job two to depend on. After okay means that after the job one has been completed successfully. That is, it was not, uh, it, it did not fail. You can replace this with after any as over here. That would basically mean that run the job two, doesn't matter how job one, you know, ended, if it failed or it completed successfully. Uh, in the last line, you can see that we have a fourth job that we want uh, to run only if the jobs two and three have completed. So you can, you know, uh, add the chain of the jobs that you want, uh, you know, in the dash dash dependency option uh, with a comma separated list. And uh, the last one is an example of how to use the after any option. It's it's basically the same way that we use the after okay option. There are there are some other options as well. You can go to the uh, main pages of the spatch command to see uh, whatever you know fits your needs. Uh, you can also use job chaining uh, in in a job in a S batch script, uh, and for that you will need to do the dash dash dependency uh, option uh, within your uh, S batch script. Uh, job arrays is is another way of running multiple jobs. Uh, you know, bundling the jobs together, except that in this case, uh, each job will be scheduled separately instead of within the same batch script. Uh, it, it is helpful if all of your jobs use very same resources and you do not want to uh, go through the pain of submitting each job uh, you know, separately. Uh, so what you can do is you can add this option of dash dash array where you can set, the, set it to the number of jobs that you want to uh, you know, exist in the array. For example, in this case, I need, I need to schedule 10 jobs. So I'm going to set it, it from one to 10. And once you have this set, the Slurm uh, array job ID will uh, can be used as, as an index. It will have index from one to 10 for all these jobs. And you can use this to index your job directories or you know, name your output files, you know, however, however you deem you know, it. It's, it's another option that you know, can be used if you want to launch a lot of jobs of the same type in a very, very quick manner. It's not recommended that you use a for loop over S run, uh, but this way it, 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 you know, it's much better. It, it may not you know, get you the best turnaround times because you're launching a lot of, uh, small, uh, you know, a lot of small jobs, uh, but uh, you, can, you, can, you can see a case fit for that. Uh, this is the job script generator. This is uh, one of the uh, you know, uh, most fun things that I use. And uh, it's, uh, it's very helpful if uh, you are you know, very new to this and you have never written a job script before. So what this does is it provides you type of a GUI where it asks you some simple questions about your job needs. So you can tell it what type of resources you need, how many resources you need and for how long you need. It will generate a very nice batch script for you with all the uh, required options set. And in addition to that, it will also give you some basic, uh, you know, uh, variables for thread affinity. Uh, it, this may not be in any way optimized. Uh, so you may need to tweak it for your use case or you know, to make uh, the best of the, uh, of the node that you're trying to run on. Uh, but it, it is a very good starting point. So whatever is generated here may, may be able to run you know, as is, but it may not be optimal. 
So if you have never, never written a batch script before, if you if you want a starting point, this is you know this is what I would recommend. So uh, this is the link that you can go to. Uh, it's it's freely available. You know, try try it out. Uh, multi-process service for GPU nodes. Uh, so NVIDIA has this uh, thing known as multi-process service or also known as MPS, which allows for oversubscribing the GPUs uh, when, you, when they are being shared by multiple processes. Typically when you have a code which uh, uses uh, multiple ranks per GPU, uh, it's, uh, you can launch kernels on GPUs from multiple ranks, uh, but the GPU will be locked on one uh, kernel at a time. So what this service does is it, it allows uh, the GPU queue to be filled with the kernels from multiple ranks so that it can schedule as soon as it has resources available. So it's basically a way of improving throughput. In some cases, you will see significant performance improvement. So it's highly recommended that you use this. Uh, you can enable uh, the MPS service on uh, GPU nodes using this command over here. And once you have uh, completed your executable, you can quit this by using this option. Uh, to, to make things easier for you, we have, an, uh, have a NERSC wrapper script, which you can use and it's available at this link. Uh, it will basically you know, make things very simple for you. You won't have to go through the details of uh, how to turn the MPS on. You can just basically provide your command line and the wrapper script will do, do everything for you. Uh, for this to, uh, for MPS to run, make sure that you do not do any type of GPU binding. You have all the ranks, have all the GPUs uh, visible to them. Uh, so once you have your jobs up and running, you would want to monitor your jobs, like what state they are in, how far they are, you know, they are in, in their time. Uh, there are multiple options that you can use. SQS, uh, SQ, and S account. Uh, we'll go through these uh, separately. So the first option is SQ. Uh, by default, it will show you jobs from all the users, uh, but you can, you know, filter them out with the user ID by the dash U option. Uh, SQS is a nurse wrapper on SQ. Uh, it's basically by default, it will show you the jobs that you have submitted and uh, that's I think the, the most uh, important command uh, any user probably will be using. Uh, S account allows you to view the jobs that uh, you know have been, uh, uh, that were submitted in the past and have executed or completed. Uh, SQS will only show you the ones that are currently in the queue. Uh, S account can you know be used to access the previous jobs. For example, in this case, I'm uh, uh, you know uh, querying the job that I submitted from uh, August 25 to August uh, 30, and it is going to list the jobs and uh, their state that they finished in. You can see that I had a lot of failed jobs, uh, and the account that it was charged and you know multiple other options. The good thing about S account is that you can configure uh, configure it to your needs. You can uh, request the type of output or the type of fields that you need. For example, here I'm requesting these fields like number of nodes uh, and the uh, state over here. So I can see how many nodes I used for these jobs. In the previous one, you can see that I was just told the number of CPUs that I was allocated. This is the default option, but you can request whatever you need. If you want any more information about your jobs, you can uh, do the go to the main pages of S account. There are like tons of other fields that you can explore through. Um, uh, but be mindful that the maximum query duration is one month. You won't be able to see jobs uh, more than you know, 30 days in the past or one month in the past. Uh, S-Control is uh, something that you can access to see the jobs that are currently queued or are currently being run. Uh, it can also be used to update the job specifications. Uh, for example, here I'm, uh, I, I can use my job ID to see the the job that's that was running at that moment and uh, it tells me a, a, there, there's a lot of information here about about a about single job uh, you know type of QS and uh, type of account it was charged to the number of nodes used uh, the priority uh, the fun thing with s control update is that you can change specifications or settings of the job after it's, it has been submitted for example in this case I'm using sqs to request the list of the job that is currently pending and I see that okay this job is pending the QS or the queue that it is in is GPU regular and I want to you know accelerate it or want it to go through faster and I, I have been told that I have this QS which is early signs uh, that makes my job go through faster so what I do is I use S control update I set the job ID equal to the job ID of this job over here and then I uh, set the QS to the new QS that I want this to up be updated to 
Once I've done that, I can do the SQS and see again that uh, that job has indeed been updated from GPU regular to the early science QS. Uh, be, uh, be mindful that not all the options can be updated with the QS, uh, with the update option, but some can be. Uh, if you want to cancel a job, you realize you don't want to go through with it, you can just US cancel and the job ID and it will be canceled. You can you know, see you, you can see here that I canceled the job and it's, it's not visible anymore in the SQS option. Uh, so there are some best practices, uh, best practices I see that I'm about to run out of time. So let's go through this quickly. Uh, uh, we have, it's always good to go to the documentation page and see the type of uh, queues that we have and their limitations. Uh, this is the, a snapshot from the Perlmutter GPU queue. This is from uh, the Perlmutter CPU queue. You can, you know, it's, it's always, these things are changing, you know, frequently. So just, you know, just go here and have a look at what the policy is currently. Uh, it's to get good turnaround time, it's good to know what's happening underneath. Uh, so the jobs are scheduled based on a complex combination of the of a priority value, which is basically a combination of you know a lot of different uh, things. Uh, the, the priority value is associated with each job, and then we have two slump schedulers, a main and a backfill one. The main scheduler schedules job in the order of the priority list for a few days in the future, while the backfill scheduler schedules the small and short jobs that can be run in the you know, gaps in between uh, the, the large ones. So what that tells us is that if you have a small job requesting resources for a short time, they can take advantage of the backfill opportunity. So make sure that to get a good turnaround time, you, you, know, you check the resources appropriately so that you know, you're getting a quick turnaround time. If you have a very long job, uh, try to you know checkpoint and try to break it into, uh, try to use the preempt uh, queue so that your job can be scheduled quickly. Uh, it's important for all the users to request only the time that they need, because that will make your job go through faster as well as help others get their jobs scheduled faster. Uh, for the large jobs, uh, it can uh, become a little difficult to launch. So because your executable has to be available on every node, so it's recommended that you use SVCast to you know, distribute your executable to all the nodes in your temporary storage and then run. That will make things faster for you. Uh, it's recommended that you do a static build for the large jobs. Otherwise, your uh, the dynamic uh, libraries uh, that will need to be accessed at runtime uh, from you know, from all the nodes that will make things very slow. Uh, we, we have a shifter talk coming up in the afternoon that will basically discuss how to launch the large jobs because uh, that that have shared libraries associated with them because then you have the shared libraries available on all the nodes through the shifter image. Uh, it's uh, it's I, so this, this is something which I'm repeating from in the morning that Rebecca mentioned that. Uh, IO is not optimized for global home. It's recommended that you use the uh, the scratch file system, which is a high performance parallel file system uh, for large jobs. And uh, if you have a shared software, consider putting that in the global common software. If it's a very large software, you need a lot of space, you can open a ticket and request for more storage. Uh, for further information, uh, please refer to the nurse documentation. Everything that I covered here is available at this hyperlink and with a lot of more information. Uh, if you still have any issue, please open a ticket with us at help.nursk.gov. Uh, thank you very much uh, and welcome to NERSC.